This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Welcome to the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Jeff Malov, and with me is my buddy, my good pal, Mark Souza. How you doing, buddy? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. We got some stuff to talk about this today in sports. We got to talk about the recapping of Game 1 of the World Series between the Dodgers and Red Sox. Anything happen in, in that game? Well, we're going to get on that um, later on about a certain pitcher, but we won't <laughs> talk about that right now. Uh, we also will talk about uh, the NBA with Blake, uh, starting with Blake Griffin having 50 points in his, uh, in his game with the Detroit Pistons. And we'll talk about some trades and other injuries that have happened in the NFL. So let's get right into World Series Game 1, Kershaw versus Sale. Red Sox took Game 1. Uh, it was a close game in particular... Uh, certain in innings, but it got away for the Reds. It got away from the Dodgers as Red Sox beat the Dodgers eight to four. Clayton Kershaw only pitched four innings this game, with uh, seven hits allowed, five earned runs, and only five strikeouts. So he had a pretty rough game. Yes, he did. I think both pitchers um, had a tough game. Uh, Kershaw probably a little bit tougher than Sale, but they both uh, pitched four innings, but. One gave up three, the other gave up five. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and Kershaw wasn't helped by you know his relief pitching to give him you know fair credit there. But mm-hmm. uh, those runs are a lot runners that he allowed on base, so they do get charged to him. But it was definitely a night for the hitters last night. Twelve runs scored with two of the best pitchers in baseball. Eight to four. I mean, um, yes, it was another unsatisfactory Clayton Kershaw postseason performance. But I just want to kind of tip my cap to the hitters of last night, even for Los You're Angeles. You're not wearing a hat, though. Yeah, but I thought it was an appropriate thing to say since we were talking about baseball. Okay, that Tip makes my sense. cap. Uh, yeah, but, uh, I mean, it was a hitter's night, you know, not just Nunez and his big three-run homer. We saw Camp hit one out. Uh, we saw we saw some players like Machado, like J.D. Martinez, uh, we saw the hitters live Five up to their Five different hype. Red Sox players had an RBI. Mm-hmm. We saw we saw the Red Sox and Dodgers uh, batting lineups really live up to the hype that you know they came in with. Yeah, but I got to ask you a question about Clinton Kershaw. Like he's been known as the best, one of the best pitchers in the league. Do you think it's um, it should be considered him as a in a postseason matter? Do you think he's still one of the best? Uh, I think he's, a, you know, better than most. Uh, he will get a lot of the blame when they lose. Um, it is, if you're not a fan of him, it's easy to kind of bash him and uh, point to his postseason lack of success as a reason that he's not one of the best pitchers or maybe as like a, a detriment to his career or something like that. But, yeah, I mean, it's a... Uh, it's another game that he obviously will will take um, as you know disappointment. But I mean, at the end of the day, if you're giving me a list of pitchers in the in the current Major League Baseball, who do I want to pitch in a game that matters? Kershaw is still going to be on that list. I don't know. He obviously wouldn't be the number one person on that list, but he'll be up there because I mean, at the end of the day, he does have very good stuff. He can pitch really well. His velocity is down, which is concerning. But still, he has a good repertoire of pitches, and well, you know, when you give up runs to the Red Sox, it's not. I don't really count that as, um, you know, like you're giving up runs to the San Diego Padres or something like that. I mean, we are talking about the best lineup in baseball. It, it just seems to me like Kershaw, like 
you when you expect clutch performances, you almost can't rely on him. Yeah, he has yeah, now a little bit. He has now given up five or more runs in eight postseason games, which is the most in Major League Baseball history. And coming from a, an ace, too, it's not just like some four or five pitcher in the rotation; it's the one pitcher. Mm-hmm. So you can look at that two ways. You can look at that as, yeah, he struggles in the postseason, and then you can also look at it as, yeah, well, he's so good that he gets his team in the postseason. He puts his team in positions to win those games, uh, at least play in the game. Obviously, some games he's um, he's roughed up a little bit, and maybe his team doesn't have the best chance to win that night. But for the most part, I mean, he's been one of the best pitchers of the last you know decade or so. Yeah, but I still put an asterisk on that because of his pitching performance in the postseason because that's where it counts the most. You can have all the regular season accolades, but without a World Series ring or having the opportunity to win one and not coming in at the at your best for your team, that's going to be a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Like you look at Madison Bumgarner. Like everyone compares those two more than any other pitchers in the league just because of their rivals and all that. But mm-hmm. Bumgarner, um, people say like, yeah, give me Kershaw in the regular season. But when it comes to the postseason, Madison Bumgarner is the best pitcher. Yeah, uh, yeah, between the two, absolutely. Well, arguably, Madison Bumgarner had one of the greatest postseason performances for any pitcher in any decade or any century, a matter of fact, just of how dominant he was, honestly, single-handedly giving the Giants a 2014 World Series title with some hitting, with some help with the hitting, of course. But the matter of the fact is, fact of the matter is, uh, Kershaw almost like is a question mark when you put him in in the postseason, especially them right now in the World Series. Do you put him in for Game Five? Yeah, absolutely. There's, I mean, it's not like they have Mass and Bumgarner on their staff. You know, like they wish they have good players. They have other good pitchers that we'll get into as the but series moves would you on. Put the, would you? Would you be? thinking about that though like who would else could play in a, in a game five like would you like if you're if you're on the no you're not staff, taking them out of the rotation i think that no no not out of the rotation just like considering maybe waiting a little longer and pitching him one game six yeah if there is a game six or a game i mean aren't you just kind of substituting a pressure game for a more pressure game well, in I, that in that regard like get, if they get to game six it's obviously a bigger game than game five it just seems like kershaw is getting in his head like once those like once he gives us some runs you can see him get mentally frustrated he doesn't keep his composure after a couple of runs yeah i mean it's tough last night it's easy to to say that to say that he just continued the trend but i mean the Red Sox hitters are very good. I mean, they're very good at pitch selection. They're very good at taking pitches. Well, I'm not taking anything away from the Red Sox, who are the best team in baseball for a reason. But the fact of the matter is, like, there's got to be some there's got to be some doubts in the minds of uh, some uh, Dodger players as well as Dodger fans when Kershaw steps onto the field. Uh, I would say that the team probably doesn't share those doubts, but of course, fans some fans do. I mean, they're with the guy every you, day. You don't think there's... They're like, with the guy every day. They know how hard he trains. They know how hard he studies the game. Like, if there's one thing that we know about Clint Kershaw, that he's a professional, he does everything the right way. Um, his teammates have never said otherwise. Uh, they all talk about the kind of guy he is. Um, so, I mean, yeah. Has he struggled in the postseason? Absolutely. But do do I think his teammates have lost confidence in him? I absolutely do not. Okay. That, that makes but if sense. you're a fan, of course you are. Because... When you're a fan and you're a, a, let's say you're a Dodgers fan and you've gone through the ups and downs and the so close and yet so far seasons, you're going to be frustrated and you're going to say things in the heat of the moment. And after the loss last night or after Kershaw got pulled, you're probably like, man, we should trade him, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? I wouldn't say trade him. That's, that's a whole different story. Right. But when you're, what the point is that when fans, of course, fans might have lost some of, some fans might have lost their confidence in him, but I don't think that carries over to the team, to the head coach, and to the organization. Okay, I see your point, but the, I just def, there's definitely some concern though when your ace gives. Like, is this a bad sign? Like, is this uh, like going to be a sweep? Do you think the sweep is possible? I mean, it's possible because the Red Sox we saw last night. Like, this team can hit the ball. I mean. <laughs> I know we're talking about Kershaw having a bad performance, but let's talk about 
they're hitting. This team is relentless. It's Nunez like, is the one they hit a three one from. He's yeah, of all is, people, of, yeah. of all people, you worry yeah. about everybody in this lineup, and you're probably like, oh, Nunez, he's okay, but we don't really have to focus he, on he, him. He's the guy that just gets on base because he has some speed on him. He's yeah, not he's a guy more you, of a contact guy. He, yeah. He can move a little bit around the base pass. Like he's an all around. He's decent more of a player. defensive guy too than a hitter. Yeah, I mean the the what I ga- what I gathered from last night watching that game is pretty much what I've thought about the Red Sox all season and definitely here in the last few weeks is that the best word to describe them for me is relentless. This offense is relentless. Yeah, they, the they Dodgers scrap they scrap back last night. They tie the game. The Red Sox come right back. The Dodgers again. They close the gap. They score again to tie the game. Red Sox come right back. They take the lead. The Dodgers score again to go down one run. So now it's 5-4. What, is, what do the Red Sox do? Knockout punch. Like It's, it's just like I feel like it's a very... Um, this team doesn't get rattled. I just feel like it is a what's the right word like it it was such a i don't know punch to the gut performance for the dodgers because i thought they played pretty well at least they hit the ball well like they they were on base they put themselves in running and scoring position but it it must be disheartening to know that you really like gave them your best shot last night and lost by four runs you know like that's how that's my takeaway from it it's baseball. So Anything think, can happen. You know, I don't know about a sweep, though. Are you, what, are you seeing a sweep? Uh, from what I saw in game one, it's definitely a possibility. Like, and we'll preview game two here in the next segment. But, um, but yeah, you think so? You, I mean, are you, are you fairly if confident? If any team can do that, it's the Red Sox. I know that sounds so cliche, but it's just like this team is so relentless and so good every given night that – can the can the can the Dodgers stop them? And I don't think they can. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing the about Astros, baseball though, the thing about baseball though is it's heavily reliant on the pitching performance of that night. So, even though the Red Sox look unstoppable, it looks like they have the better lineup. It just takes one night of a poor performance from one of their pitchers or a big night from one of the Dodgers pitchers. To go five or six games, I I think I originally said six games, and I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it at six until I'm gonna keep my five. Yeah, I mean I, I I like both right now. I mean obviously I think the Red Sox, especially if they win tonight, and we'll preview that game here in just a few minutes after the break. But I mean, it it will be a tough thing to do for the Dodgers to uh, go down two zero, even though they're going back home. It would be tough because the Red Sox at that point, they would have the momentum. It's just their lineup. Like they just can hit the ball. They can run. It's um, it's a lot. But you know, going back to a National League bar- ballpark that kind of neutralizes the Red Sox a little bit. As JD Martinez, I don't know if he would play in the field or be used as like a pinch runner, maybe late game substitution to get his bat in the game for a couple at bats, but. I can see def like at least a pinch hitter. Oh yeah, he's got to play. He will pinch it minimum, but you could see like maybe the first four innings they use a different player, and then they use him because they're down a run or something like that. Like, hey, yes, you're gonna pinch hit, but we're also gonna keep you in the game so you can hit again. So right, um, yeah, I mean that's just what I took. I took from last night's game is how relentless Boston is. And how disheartening that had to be for L.A. We They pitched their best pitcher. They scored runs. They fought back. They clawed back in that game multiple times. And yet, at the end of the day, they lose by four runs. Um, Does that show how dominant uh, the Red Sox have been this entire season? I mean, I think so, yeah. Because you have Chris Sale, who definitely didn't have his best night last night. Did, was he terrible? No. But he, he was... He, he pitched was, four innings just like Bump... Or Bump Carter, uh, Kershaw did. Yeah, he was, I would say, average or below average. I mean, obviously, you got to consider the opponent. So the Dodgers can hit the ball too, you know. But, um, yeah, I would say he he wasn't at his A game, but the Red Sox are like, don't worry about it. We're going to score eight runs tonight against one of the best pitchers in baseball. So I don't know, man. It's hard to find the weakness in the Red Sox at this point. Yeah. Um, it's, it seems like just a gigantic wall that doesn't have any – like holes in it like you said this team just looks 
like it's it's almost unfair. Just how like how every player is on a hot streak right now for the Red Sox, and you don't really see it that often. Usually, it's like one guy coming in clutch for the team when they're down. But this, everyone got a hit. Like, well, not everyone, but like I'm saying, like everyone contributed, and you don't really see it that often in a certain situation in postseason play. Mm-hmm. Because of just the fact that people get kind of nervous, there's some some people just have the the cold streaks. But I don't see any cold streaks with the Red Sox right now. Yeah, I mean they're su- they're such a deep team that even if one or two guys are slumping, they have five or six other guys. They have Eduardo Nunez off the bench at a three run homer. I mean, you know, like it's if Mookie Betts having a bad day, well, then Ben Attendi steps up, or you know what I mean. Like it's just this team's just stacked. Exactly. There's no weakness and. And it wasn't even like they paid for these players. A lot of it was like... Homegrown, yeah. Yeah, them. For the farm system and all that. Bogarts, uh, Mookie Betts, yeah. yeah. Like, J.D. Martinez came from another team, granted, mm-hmm. but like... They have a couple big signings. I mean, sale and price. Like, yeah. those are big, t- you know, trades But you and wouldn't signings. say, like, those are the reasons they're so good right now. Like, the only reasons. Like, there's so much more to them than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's truly just in- what I think is incredible, of how just con- good they everyone's playing. Yeah, and you know, to not to take anything away from the Dodgers, it was just one game. But you know, them them the same way. The Dodgers have made a lot of splash signings like Machado, but they've also brought guys up like Bellinger. Like they have a nice mix of free agents and homegrown talent. We saw uh, Urias last night pitch out of the bullpen. I mean, he's a great looking young pitcher through their farm system. You know, yeah. so I think we should uh, take a quick break, and then when we come back. You want to talk about game two? tonight i would love to cool so we'll do that right when we get back are you looking for the very best nfl and college football podcast then check out the gsmc football podcast get the latest football news both on and off the field from the nfl draft to trades to the rumor mill to the nfl combines they got you covered that's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast get updates on college rivalries game day insights and much much more it's football talk the way you want it this show eats sleeps and breathes football don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Sports Podcast. We just finished talking about Game 1 of the World Series between the Red Sox and Dodgers. Just a quick little thing of Game 2. We have who we have Ryu versus Price, mm-hmm. respectively, for the Red Sox and Dodgers. Who do you have seen taking this one? We'll just do a quick take. Uh, I like Red Sox because Ryu's last, uh, last outing wasn't so great, and he's never pitched in Fenway before. He talked about how... Um, amazing of an experience it will be that he's always wa- seen Fenway on TV. I think he'll it'll be a little bit too much for him tonight, and I think the momentum of the Red Sox winning Game One will carry them to another win. Yeah, and Price had a great Game Five. Really clinch. did, and best game first, of his career, in my opinion. Yeah, well, he clinched. A, he won a game for the first time in his. In he his won a post, game, and it was a, super a po- impressive. A postseason win. Let's say that. Yeah, you get the win, and you, you and know was, outperform, and perform was, like that. And it was against the defending World Series champions in the Astros, who did not lose a lot of guys in the offseason. They were still the, one of the best teams in baseball. So, all things considered, if Price keeps on momentum, if he plays like he did in Game Five, I, I think it's a win for the Red Sox as well. But we will we shall see. Uh, we're going to move on to basketball now. Uh, I think one of the top main th- topics of basketball right now is Blake Griffin had 50 points in his game with Detroit the other day. Yeah, insane. First time in his career. Which, like, for a first overall pick, that's kind of shock. I know 50 points is a lot, granted. But he was a first overall pick in 2008, I believe. Mm-hmm. That sounds about right. 
and he was rookie of the year. He's had some like pretty solid seasons, but he's been been mainly known as like just a highlight reel with dunks and everything. But this was like a full on basketball performance. Yeah, star player performance. Yeah, and you know he got it with winning the game. I mean, he drives to the lane with less than two seconds left. He gets the layup, um, and he's fouled. So he does it in style. It's not just a meaningless fifty point game or. Um, you know, something it that was doesn't needed. Care. Yeah, he they needed all fifty of those points to win the game. So, um, Detroit improves to three and zero. They beat Philadelphia. That's an impressive win. Blake it, Griffin is, had a great it game. Isn't it kind of weird that like only like a few years ago, Philadelphia seventy six years were like the butt the butt of all jokes, and now they're a serious contender for the uh, Eastern Conference. Uh, yeah, I it mean, was, it was all about the process. You gotta trust the process, Jeff. Just who knew, trust who knew the process. Actually, who knew it was actually gonna work? Uh, like probably three people, yeah. and and I mean, I'm a. I thought it was going to eventually work. I mean, at some point, you're just gonna these draft picks are gonna have to just be good. I mean, that's you, not true. They missed on a lot, but they you hit on it. Like it's just a. It's just the averages. Like yeah, you can mess up two times, but you're gonna get a star on the third one. And you know, well, if I you mean, look at other teams, that hasn't really been the case for them. Yeah, so there's been some bad picks for teams for a long time, but. Fact of the matter is, Griffin only had, I mean, 35 shots and 50 points. You'll take that. That's not bad. It's, you, you know. Of course, a lot of it was in, like, all, well, all of it was in dead shots. He had five threes. Did five he? for 10. He shot 10 threes? And hit five of them. Blake Griffin or Kevin Durant? I'm not sure. No. Wow. If I told you that a player last night went 20 for 35 and hit five of 10 from three, you'd be like, oh, Kevin Durant. Or like... Anybody besides a power forward like Blake Griffin, maybe Anthony Davis, but yeah, you're right. Like that's like a Demarcus Cousins type of thing. Because Demarcus Cousins has been shooting threes recently. Yeah, the last few years for sure. Um, yeah, but I mean that's a really good all around game for Griffin. He also chipped in with 14 boards and six assists, almost a triple double, which would have been great. Yeah, you so think he was trying to go for a triple double. Like he saw he had 14, like 10 rebounds. Like let's see if I can get like. Five more assists. Uh, I don't think he was really thinking about that. He's probably just thinking about winning the game since it went to overtime and all that. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I mean, the Sixers, they lose another game to uh, to a top – or not a top team in the East. I'm not going to say Detroit's a top team in the East, but a potential playoff team, most likely a playoff team in the Detroit Pistons. Pistons are 3-0, and um, like I mentioned, so – uh, we'll see. Well, do you think the Sixers? Do you think the Sixers need to start beating some of these teams just for their mental edge? Like, um, you don't want to just like, lose to the do top you think they teams. Sh- they should be like panic mode or something like that, or like worry maybe a little bit. I mean, I don't know if I would say panic mode, but just like um, they're trying to take that next step, right? Like last year, they were just like happy to be there type thing. This is a year where the Sixers are trying to be a force in the East, right? But we've seen them get smacked like, already. This is their chance to really like make it to the finals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we just saw them lose. They got smacked by Boston. They lose to the Pistons. They they beat the Magic, but it wasn't pretty. Um, they you know their one easy win was against the Bulls. It's still early in the season, but it is interesting because they are a team that I think. A lot of people have as top three in the Eastern Conference, but at the same time, it's you know it's one of those things where they're still a young team. Maybe they have a sophomore slump, quote unquote. Um, but I guess that will remain. Maybe to be not, seen. maybe not a sophomore slump yet. But let's give them like till the All Star break to really consider this is like a down year for them because there's still plenty of black basketball left to play. So I want to talk about another team that played last night that has started off the season very impressively. And who is that? The Denver Nuggets. The Denver Nuggets of yeah, Colorado. Yeah, this isn't, this isn't your father's Denver Nuggets, all right? This is a new Denver Nuggets, Jeff. Okay, why you, why, is, why is my dad's Denver Nuggets not the same? Because these they Nuggets are... Mutombo. These Nuggets are 4-0, and and they have looked... Very, very impressive to start the season. I see. I mm-hmm. see what you're saying. I see the. I see the dishing you're out. 
They have beat the Clippers, the Suns, not the not the best teams, but they beat the Warriors and they took care of the Kings. Now I get it. Three of those four teams aren't the best teams in the West, and they're probably not playoff teams. But considering the fact that they've beaten the Warriors, they're four and zero. They've handled every game that they've been. In fact, the Warriors game was the only close game. You know, they took care of business against the bad teams. And in the NBA, you know that's important. Absolutely. Take care of those games. Don't don't make them close. Let your guys rest because you're winning in the fourth quarter and things like that. So what do you think about these Denver Nuggets? Do you think that they're for real? And when I say for real, I think most people have them as a playoff team. But do you think that they are a top four team in the West? Top four. As we got of the right Warriors. Now. I think we'll take them and move them to the side. So we got who's next? The Rockets, the Jazz, the Lakers have been talked about as a top four I feel team. Like, I feel like they can be better than the Lakers at this moment right now. And you know what? It's interesting you say that. Why? Because they play tomorrow, the Lakers and the Nuggets. Ooh, I guess we'll find out then. Mwah. Why did I say Mwah? It's not evil. This Denver Nuggets team, though, man, they are no joke. They can play defense. Uh, you know, as we saw, what, I mean, the play this the early season so far is Hernan Gomez with the block against the Warriors to win the game. But they have players. They have a, a very interesting team. They don't have a lot of guys on the team that most casual fans know. I mean, even Paul Millsap is not really a star in this league. He's a guy that's been good for a while. You got Jamal Murray. You got uh, Jokic. Jokic is actually a phenomenal basketball player, but he still isn't a household name. Not a lot of people know him. So... They they are a team that gets it done in multiple ways. They are the uh, the underdog type team where they're like they really are. You don't really know who is they who are these guys, but in reality, it's like, well, these team is good. They work really well together. They they play extremely well with each other. Yeah, exactly. Um, they're just they're looking like a real solid team. So uh, they're a team that we need to. I think take take a look at and maybe take them very seriously. Put them under the microscope. We got to look at like how this team is doing so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the other uh, game. So the Nuggets won one twenty six one twelve last night. Um, but the other game that I want to talk about is the New Orleans Pelicans. They win again to stay undefeated, one sixteen to one oh nine one oh nine. Anthony Davis. As you know, he's, what, the best player on the Pelicans? 34-13-2 last That's night. That's a pretty obvious statement. 34-13-2 last night. Um, Alfred Payton chipped in with 26-6. and six. What do you think about the Pelicans? Do you think that they're for real? 3-0 and team? Playoff um, team? A possible playoff team. Definitely, like, in the top eight. But you know they smacked the Rockets on opening night, and they um, did beat the Rockets handily. Mm -hmm. But by what nineteen, yeah. But I gotta ask, what happens when these games like count for a championship? You know what I mean? You mean like what playoffs? Do you, well, I mean, yeah, they can make the playoffs. So we'll see. But can they handle these teams in the playoffs? Because I feel like every when the good teams, I don't know about the handle these teams in the playoffs. But do you think they're a playoff team? They could definitely get there. It's mm -hmm. a possibility. Would you have them above a team like Portland, who's two and one? San Antonio, who's two and two and I, one. I don't put them above San Antonio. What about Minnesota? Two and two, Minnesota. Um, yeah. What about the two teams that are winless in the Western Conference, the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Los Angeles Lakers? When you, if you said that like a month before this season, like these two would start off winless. People would laugh at you. Then they have LeBron. They have Russell Westbrook. They have Paul George. They have uh, mm -hmm. Lonzo Ball, Ronjo Rondo. Yeah. So it's definitely a surprising factor to say the least. Mm -hmm. So there's a big game on tonight in the NBA. Jazz and Rockets. They're, That's a good game. They're both one and two, which is uh, not the start that both teams were looking for. That's for sure. We're talking about two teams that should be at the top of the Western Conference, not, of course, over Golden State, Keyword but in, should. in the consideration for a top four seed in the playoffs. Tonight at the Toyota Center, 
the Utah Jazz go against the Rockets. So we might learn a little bit more about these uh, about these teams tonight um, as we you know navigate through this incredibly early part of the NBA season. Uh, another interesting game that you might be um, looking at tonight, Jeff. The 76ers play the Milwaukee Bucks. Ooh! So the Giannis Sixers versus Embiid. The Sixers are coming off a. Of, they're on a back to back tonight, and they have to go to Milwaukee to face Giannis and the Bucks. I don't. I don't think that's going to go well for them. Coming off a of back, coming on a you know second night of a back to back. Yeah, that is pretty rough, all things considered. Will you be catching the Lakers Suns game tonight? The Lakers are winless. They play at Phoenix. They this is this could be their first win, but maybe DeAndre Aiden shows why he's the number one overall pick and upsets the Lakers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll see. Um, it, it is an interesting week in the NBA. There are some notable matchups. Uh, yeah. So I think we should take a quick break. When we come back, we have some NFL news, uh, injury news, off the field news, things that are important as we approach Week Eight of the NFL season, things you should know before, uh, you know, setting your, your fantasy lineups, maybe, maybe placing those bets and things like that. So we'll be right back right after this. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Sports Podcast. We just finished talking about the NBA and how good these teams are that are undefeated and how good the teams are that haven't even won a game. So we're looking into the NFL, and you have some news for us, Mark, on the Raiders situation in Oakland with John Gruden. Do you, sir? Yes. So earlier this week, Amari Cooper was traded from the Raiders to the Cowboys for a first-round pick. So that was very newsworthy to start off the week. However, some players speaking anonymously uh, to The Athletic uh, talked about being upset and not being happy with the way John Gruden has handled these trades. First, the Khalil Mack deal. Of course, earlier in the year, that sent Khalil Mack to the Bears for two first-round picks. Um, and then now Cooper. So two of their young, promising players have now been shipped off, but I guess some of the players are not happy with how it was handled. Um, players were told that they were not going to trade Amari Cooper, and they didn't think that he was. You know, they come back from the bye week. Everybody got a week off. They come back. They learn that he was traded. But players actually learned that he was traded via Twitter and via... Um, they weren't told? No. So That's rough. He was taken off the practice field, um, and players actually had to find out the new-fashioned way, not the old-fashioned way. The new-fashioned way? Yeah. <laughs> I like Getting that. a text like, man, what happened? You know, things like that. So, How confused would you be? If you're one of those players, like, got a text, like, dude, do you know Cooper? Do you, what about Cooper? And he go, what are you talking about? He goes, he just got traded. And then you're like, wait, what? I don't understand. So these are quotes from players anonymously, as reported by The Athletic. Are you ready to hear them? I am ready. 
I think many of us realize we won't be here next year. We are just waiting to see if we will be here next week. Ooh, ouch. Here, here's another quote. You have to wonder if we haven't been playing for draft picks all along, despite everything the coaches told us at training camp. All right. That's kind of harsh. Yeah. A uh, little mean, little mean. So we'll see. So Reggie McKenzie got the call from the Dallas Cowboys and came to the practice field and said, hey, they're offering us first-round pick. And, they, and John Gruden said yes. So if anybody out there was wondering or was confused still who had control in Oakland, I think that's a resounding answer for John Gruden. The general manager walks down and says, hey, this is the offer. Do we do this or not? He says, yes, they do it. So what do you make of this if you're a Raiders player or a Raiders fan, Jeff? Um, that's kind of tough, but mm, I, I think you just got to bite your tongue and deal with it. What else can you do? Mm-hmm. So one player did speak and put his name on it. What did he say? He said, nobody was happy when we traded Khalil. Nobody's happy that we traded Amari. How could you be? You never, ever want to trade elite homegrown talent. But Coach Gruden is thinking long term. It's no secret that he had, he got a 10-year contract. And having five first-rounders in the next two years is pretty good. This is true. Having five first-rounders is definitely a positive. And he also said, our job is not to second-guess what Coach Gruden and McKenzie do. Our job is to play football. Hopefully these last 10 games, the players... The young players on this team watch and learn how to play hard and be a pro in terms of adversity. So, interesting news out of Oakland. Um, it sounds like there might be a rift between John Gruden and the locker room. So, I think that we need to pay attention this weekend as they host the Indianapolis Colts, Jeff, because this is a game where John Gruden could actually lose the locker room, in my opinion. If they lose this game, if it's ugly, they're at home against Andrew Luck and the Colts. It could it could smell trouble for the rest of this year in terms of how into it the players are. Would you agree with that? I I can definitely see that happening. Um, it does feel like maybe the, f the fact of the matter is he's making a point like this is his team type of thing. But... If you lose that locker room, regardless of what you're trying to do for the future, they don't trust you for that period of time they're there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's it's a yeah. You lose a, trust. You lose the locker room. Yeah, it's a pretty t it's a pretty scary situation. So I have news about the Minnesota Vikings, who are four two and one. They have a big game this Sunday night on NBC against the New Orleans Saints. Maybe the game of the week, but. It sounds like their star young running back, Dalvin Cook, will be will miss this game, but he will also miss at least two more games. It sounds like they're going to shut him down until week 11. But it sounds like Everson Griffin will be available as he has come back to team activities. He is back in the building. So what do you make about these two things for the Vikings? Two big well, news for, updates. For Griffin, he did have that problem in the hotel where he kind of threatened to kill people and shoot people. And he also he said that he was leaving the team for personal matters. And those, I guess, personal matters have subsided. But I, I don't know what his mental state is. And that would concern me, to be honest. Just because, like, you don't know. Like, we don't know how what the circumstances are of him returning and all this stuff. And losing Delvin Cook, your one running back. He well, hasn't really been there for most of the season, though. Just yeah. two games played. But the fact of the matter is, that's still your one. That, that was supposed to be your one going into the season. And mm -hmm. with him being out this long, yes, he gives other running backs a chance to shine. But again, you're missing a vile key to your offense. And it's, that's not easy. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Everson Griffin, I mean, the, for talent alone, he would definitely boost that defense. The defense for Minnesota has taken a step back this year after being one of the more dominant units last year. So talent alone, Jeff, you got to think that his return will at least boost the defense if he is in shape and all that. We don't really know because we don't know what he's been doing since he's been away from the team. 
But, I mean, you have to figure, if not this week, at least for the foreseeable future, that he will be a boost, at least in the pass rush. Yes, uh, he has to be. Like, that. they need him to do that. That is his duty. For and- Dalvin Cook, I mean, it's... He's a loss, but Mur- I feel like Latavius Murray has shown that he can handle the load. Oh, absolutely! But like Cook played extremely well last season. That's why he's a I th- more dynamic player too. Yeah, I I just think it it still hurts losing a guy like that, like a guy that's that came alive last season, and you expect him to keep on getting better, and then you lose him again, again. Yeah, it's just like that's demoralizing. Yeah, last year's ACL for Cook. This year, a um, a, a hamstring injury is. Kept him out. So. It's not as serious, fortunately. Yeah, it might not be, but at the same time, he's now missed six football games because of it. So we will see. We will see how that works. Uh, did you have other injury news that you want to discuss? Uh, Sonny Michel, he got carted off the field in it, the game last last Sunday, which worried people, understandably so. But it has been reported that it's not serious. There's no actual um, specific injury of what it is but they say it's not a serious injury and he should be back moment uh, like, like momentarily it should be only a matter of time oh really okay so he's not gonna be out for an extended amount of time that's what the report says will he play this week uh that is i believe that is a coach's decision so it sounds like that he's might not be we'll, we'll check to see if he's practicing this week that'll probably tell us all we need to know yeah but i think it's good news that it's nothing serious he doesn't need surgery or anything like that i think that's the main part of this story that yeah, fortunately no, he's no not structural damage right yeah, yeah yeah fortunately it's not nothing anything too serious well that's like, uh, no no surgery needed which is a good thing yeah, that's really good because news. he's been on a roll lately yeah uh other injury news you'd like to share um mm, Bilal Powell oh right yes his neck injury he's put on injured reserved and he's most likely done for the season yeah if he's on IR um I think this is from now on if you're put on IR you cannot return this year after this week so uh would you say that's a big blow for the Jets um He's actually been the running back who gets more the more snaps time. that's why I was saying like he gets more snaps than uh Crowell does, and now Crowell's going to be getting all those snaps. Yeah. Um, so this is Crowell's chance to play a little better, but overall, it does it does hurt losing the guy you gave the ball to the most out of the out of your two running backs. Yeah, Powell. Uh, you know, Crowell has been the running back that's made the big plays this year for the Jets, but Powell actually is the one who does more things for that offense. He's a pass catching running back, so he's in on third downs. He actually gets more carries and snaps than Crowell on average. So with him out, it gives a, a chance for a guy like Trenton Cannon, young running back, to to have a role in this offense. I mean, obviously we know Crowell is going to get the bulk of the uh, running carries, but the pass receptions, the third down work, you know, that stuff is available. I would expect Crowell to get a little bit of it, but somebody should be able to come in and handle that kind of role. Uh any other news that you'd like to share? Uh, no. Anything you want to share? Not in the NFL. Uh, we should take a break when we come back. Actually, there are a couple things we'll talk about in the NFL, a couple news and notes around sports, NBA, MLB, and we'll do that right after this. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info.
And welcome back to the GSMC Sports Podcast. We just finished talking about NFL injuries and the Raiders and their corruption that's happening inside their uh, headquarters. Now we're going to be talking more about the NFL trade deadline that's been kind of spiraling around. Eli Apple has been traded from the Giants to the New Orleans Saints, which puts a big question mark on where Patrick Peterson is going to end up if he is traded because he wanted to go to the New Orleans Saints, but now they got Eli Apple. So does this change where Patrick Peterson goes, do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. What, I don't know if this would change for the Saints. Like, I, I don't know if Eli Apple's necessarily the guy, the answer, where that you wouldn't consider Patrick Peterson. I mean, I still think that they would st- still consider adding Patrick Peterson for the right price. They're looking for a Super Bowl at this point. Mm-hmm. So there's no, you know, you, know the, you need multiple cornerbacks in the NFL. You need three, four, sometimes even more corners with these um the more teams. the merrier yeah you're gonna have to play these teams have three four wide receivers i mean now i'm just saying can they afford to because they're pro- the cardinals are probably gonna ask for a lot yeah i would that's their, say that's their, that was their cornerstone of their defense i just don't know if there's a huge trade market for patrick peterson but mm-hmm. again it only takes one team just like how the raiders traded amari cooper for a first round pick a lot of people didn't think that he they were going to be able to fetch a first round pick but they did because it takes one team. So, uh, Patrick Peterson, though, I would say probably wants to go to a team that has a chance to win, considering he's, you know, asking for a trade. I don't think he wants to go to a team that is losing, like the team he's on now. But again, I am assuming. I could see the Saints still be interested, though, and still making that phone call to see what it would take. But... When you're, if you're a Giants fan and you woke up to the news that Eli was traded, did you initially think that it was Eli Manning? That was the meme that's been going on the last 24 hours. Were you happy to, and then realize, oh man, it's just Eli Apple? Or <laughs> again, that's like that's what everyone thought. Old, old Dale Beckham Jr. was taken. They got they traded for the wrong the, the wrong Eli. Um, yes, Eli Manning is extremely old, and he should be done career wise in the next year or so. Maybe not even then, but yeah, everyone like was like that's that was the joke. You traded the wrong Eli this, you traded along Eli that, but the fact of the matter is that's still the guy that got you two Super Bowls and started almost every game for fifteen years. So, bottom line is they really are kind of. I know he's been playing very sloppy lately, but why would you trade a th- old old quarterback? And why? Who would trade for him? That's the question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I still think Eli will in the season. Eli Manning will in the season with the New York Giants. I don't see another team going after him. Um, <laughs> the San Diego, Char- the Los Angeles Chargers, just be out of spite. I don't see a team. I know him to Jacksonville is always the talk. It's been the talk for the last couple of years. Whole Tom Coughlin thing with Jacksonville and Blake Bortles and all that, but. Man, I don't know. I just think that you might as well ride with Blake Bortles. I mean, you gave the guy an extension this off season. You actually think that he's a decent quarterback? Well, they did. Then. They did. They were only like a few plays away from a Super Bowl. Yeah, and I mean, unless you're unless you're convinced that Eli Manning gives you a better chance to win on Sunday than Blake Bortles, I mean, that person wouldn't be me who's convinced. But unless you're the general manager, you have to pick between those two. And you're, con- I mean, that's what I'm saying. If you can't tell the difference, or if you don't think there's a difference, then why would you bring someone new in? You know? Yeah. Can I? Can I? Can I get like? Can I trade for Derek Carr, please? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the Raiders would love to make that trade. They they can have like eight first round picks in the next two years. You know? Well, they already have five, which is a lot. <laughs> all things considered, that's absolutely true. That is absolutely true. Um, That's almost absurd how many draft picks that is in, in the first round, I mean. The Giants did make a trade today, though, uh, another trade. They did not trade Eli Manning again. They did not. They traded Damon Snacks. Harrison, that's got to be one of the best nicknames in sports. I was going to say, is his middle name Snacks, or is his uh, full name? Is that his nickname? Yeah, Snacks. That is – that's an awesome name. I mean, that is an absolutely – Awesome, awesome nickname. If you had to think of other awesome nicknames in sports that have to do with food. The refrigerator. Okay. What about... Um, OJ. Huh. Okay. I'm kidding. What about um, Chili Davis? 
It's a good one. Uh, this can't be more. Yeah, there has to be, right? Um, why can't I think of any other ones? So, did you see that Joel Embiid? What's his nickname now? No, oh. no, no, no. Uh, no. They're going food I stuff. was transitioning. Getting excited. Okay. Continue. No relation to this story, but... So, Andre Drummond was ejected last night. Oh, the flop. That's right. That's right. I know what you're talking about. Joel Embiid had some interesting things to say post-game. I think he had some interesting things to say on the court, too. But just talking about the post-game, he uh, says, quote, I think I own a lot of real estate in his head. We lost, so I'm not supposed to talk trash. But he knows damn well that he can't guard me. But that was a good team effort. Hmm. You know, Blake had a good game, and they were able to pull it off, so we got another one tomorrow, and we got to do a better job. So, Drummond was hit with a second technical foul yesterday. He was ejected in the fourth quarter with under a minute left. Um, you know, it. <laughs> what do you think about this? Is this a, is this a budding NBA rivalry here? Um... I f- it kind of feels like like Embiid's trying to start something that's not really there. Like I don't, s- I didn't see that he was Drummond was in hatred for the guy. It was a little bit of a flop, huh? <laughs> he smiled afterwards. He was taunting the crowd after he f- got back up. So yeah, I would consider that a flop. Mm-hmm. You know, these two have a history though, as Embiid has talked about Drummond before, how he doesn't play defense and saying that he can't shoot. So. Um, you know, Drummond there was some hate. Drummond has made fun of him beating in the past, saying that he can't stay healthy. Just uh, a lot of trash talk. So, do you think that we've seen the end of this between these two, or is this just the beginning? Um. Well, we'll see when they play each other again. If it continues, and I'm like, this is going to go on for a long time. But if it doesn't, it I, it's too tough to call. To be honest, it's like. Is this really going to be a feud, or is this going to be just a little spat they're going to have? You know? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, LeBron James, he downplays the 0-3 start. He says, you know, it's a process. He said he knows what he's got himself into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got yourself. Like, he says it wasn't for Hollywood. That was not the reason. But it kind of feels like the reason now, doesn't it? Yeah. So, I know we briefly talked about this, but... um, do you think that this is? Do you think the Lakers will figure it out? Do you do you think that this is just a? It's you know, LeBron. by the season's end, we'll laugh about how they started off so poorly and not be like, well, they started off poorly. It's a LeBron-led team, so they're probably gonna they're making the playoffs regardless. It feels like it's like when you get you get LeBron, you're like getting a ticket into the playoffs. So one way or another, I believe they're gonna make it into the playoffs. I'm not sure how far they'll go, but the fact of the matter is they're making the playoffs. What do you think about Rajon Rondo denying that he spit in Paul's face? Although it looks like the evidence is clear, they've blown up the video. They've well, shown he, it from different he angles. He was wearing a mouthpiece, and I can attest that sometimes spit flies out when you're talking. So he did push his lips together, though. Come he, on, yeah. But Come on, he spit uh, on if, him. If, I think he's thinking I didn't spit a loogie on him. I think that's what he's implying. But I'm not defending the guy. I think he still spat on him, and um. Still, I still think three games or however many he got suspended for is too little. All the, all these suspensions seem way too little. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know, man. It's he he says that it's clear that he didn't spit on purpose, but I don't know. Like whatever. Did you see uh, Rockets general manager Daryl Morey though put a uh, pot meets kettle meme on the uh, on the old Twitter machine there? What talking is that? about talking about Rondo? Oh, because you know, Rondo was saying oh, that he's I, a bad guy. I get it. Rondo was saying how Chris Paul's a bad guy and all that. So, um, hey Kettle, you're black. Yeah, that's the saying. Mm-hmm. Pot calling the kettle black. So, um, yeah. Anything else you'd like to talk about for today, or are we all done here? Um, the fact of the matter is, I think we're all done here. So game two tonight for Major League Baseball, uh, we talked about this earlier in the segment, but um, tonight, game two, 
five oh nine Pacific time, eight oh nine Eastern time. Why oh nine? Why why can't you just make a regular time? Because people say we'll turn it in at five and they don't you know miss anything, right? So it gives you more time to advertise. Actually, I still don't like the it's the advertising dollars between five and five oh nine is lit. Jeff <laughs> is lit. Can you just make it like five ten, five fifteen, like something that's on the on the hands of a clock, not five oh nine? I hate that. I it's maybe I don't know if it's like an OCD type of thing, but it like shouldn't like I hate the fact that it's not like on a certain number of what the, when the hands on the dial like when it starts. So price versus Ryu is this a must win for the Dodgers, Jeff? Yes, absolutely. If Just they so lose, then what? Sweep. Sweep. If they win, then what? Uh, we'll see you at five oh nine the next day, and God, I hate that. <laughs> like if someone said meet me at five oh seven, I would punch them in the face. <laughs> That's. That's uh, extreme. Yes, but that's just, it's a joke, but still, regardless. All right. That's violent. That is all we have time for today. Please tune in tomorrow. I will not be here, but my buddy Mark will be on his own. I trust him completely. You trust him completely. I don't trust him. You don't trust yourself? No. Yeah, I'm sure you'll be fine. And if you need me, you can just give me a call. Anyways, uh, I will be back uh, Monday. That's, I guarantee that'll be back Monday. And I will see you Monday, but he will see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I'll see you then. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.